Hey, everybody. Come on. I know lunch is coming up, but this is a, this is a terrific panel. So uh, we're, we're really uh, lucky to have uh, all the executives that we um, have had over here during the first, of the couple, uh, first couple hours. Um, but this is a really special treat for me personally. So when Dolly asked me to, to sit in here, I was actually jealous of this slot anyway. Um, so I, I want to welcome to the stage two people who have been very supportive of this um, organization and this event for almost since its inception, um, but also two of the people who are helping, who have helped shape the television industry into what it is in general, and then specifically, um, really, Scripps Networks and everything that they're about have, have in good part come from the minds and creativity of these two people. So I'd like to welcome to the stage um, Michael Smith, who's a G, a GM and SVP of the Cooking Channel. And Kathleen Finch, uh, who is president and chief creative officer of Scripps Networks. Is that so before we get into uh, the conversation, um, which is about career paths, I, um, we thought that you might want to take a look at what Scripps Networks is and what they do. Anything to add to that? Because we know you don't have televisions. <laughs> there you go. So can we roll tape? You know what? I'm going to go into your bios first. Uh, and, then, uh, and then we'll roll the tape as soon as they tell us we're, we're ready. Um, so you're Chief Programming Content and Brand Officer at Scripps Networks, which means you run all of the creative for all of the networks at Scripps. For the domestic networks, yes. We, we are very quickly becoming a global company, but we have six brands here in the U.S. HGTV, which founded our company about 25 years ago, Food Network, Cooking Channel, DIY Network, Travel Channel, and Great American Country. And so you oversee the programming, the brands, the kind of all, all, all elements of creative of all of those networks. Yes, yes. Uh, and Michael, you uh, were uh, it, one of the biggest parts of launching Cooking Channel from scratch out of, as a spinoff of uh, Food Channel. Is that correct? Uh, yeah, that's true. So, uh, and before that, your primary role was in marketing as well? Yeah, I was in charge of marketing for, for the food category for many years. And then early before that, I worked in, in creative services um, doing uh, what's called on-air promotion and design for, for uh, scripts. And then before that, I worked, um, probably you guys growing up might have heard of some of the brands I worked at when I was at Disney. I worked on um, Doug and Recess and Pepper Ann and um, a lot of um, kids programming um, for many years at the Disney Channel. So, so a lot of the creativity and brands and programming and, and filters have come, that have come out of scripts over the last couple of years, I would say, say, would safe to say, came from one of the two of you to a certain extent, correct? Well, and another 350 people. Yeah, but they're not here. <laughs> that we, so that we're going to focus we take on credit for. Um, so yeah. I think with that, we can roll tape and we can take a look and see what this means. Roll tape now. So that's a, a good, yes. If, if we had known, we could have just done the dialogue since clearly yeah, we only a, had one channel of audio working. <laughs> oh, there, was, there was a voiceover? Suppose, there was supposed to be a lot of voice on that. <laughs> that looks good we anyway. Have to though, in though, television, yeah, yeah, you have to always be willing to improvise. And yeah, we, we could have. We could have done a little hand to the down. Well, but that, was, that was the version for the hearing impaired. So that, that, that. So, but inside there, I think, I mean, I, anyway, that was still entertaining to me. To you? 
Okay, so and inside there you saw uh, brands uh, like the Property Brothers um, that were created uh, by uh, by you guys and uh, as a as a programming brand. But I think what people don't seem to realize is how important it is to have an overall brand filter, an overall brand perspective. You know, there would be no Property Brothers if you hadn't done a lot of brand exploration and brand setup to, to the point where they could be discovered and found and then turned into superstars. So can we take a, you, you end with Property Brothers, but you begin with what? How do you start, and both of you can r chime in here because both of you have done this. How do you build a channel brand or an app brand or a content brand from the ground up? You know, where do you even start? Well, I, I think brand, um, branding is, um, I always say that a brand uh, logo or symbol is basically um, emotional shorthand for a set of rational promises. What that means is that when you see the actual logo or the actual sign for the product or service, you don't actually have to have someone explain all the things behind it. You just see it and you immediately have a, get a feeling about it. Like when you see the Apple logo, you immediately think about some, something about what that means, what the promises can be. And so that, that's what we try to do in branding is by being really consistent to um, a promise that you're making to people and constantly reinforcing it um, um, behind the brand. And um, we do that with our brands, I think, really well because I think people know very clearly that if they're interested in home programming, when they see that HGTV or DIY logo, there's going to be a consistent delivery of really great, interesting home programming. And likewise, when they see the Food Network or Cooking Channel logo, they, they know exactly what that means, even before they get to the network. And so that, that, that's, that's, uh, that, you know, that's how you build brands. And then, Kathleen, how do you turn that brand into programming or to a filter? Because you can connect it to a show, but you have to connect it to a slate of shows that fill up your lineup. How do you, how do you go from that, that iconography or that mindset, to actual programming itself? This is going to sound very counterintuitive, but one of the things that I am happiest to hear is when somebody says, all your programming looks alike. <laughs> and the reason why that is a good thing, and the reason why the company that, that Michael and I work for is different, I think, than a lot of media companies, is we really are not focusing on television shows. We are focusing on brands. So the goal of any one of our networks is you turn it on at 6 o'clock when you get home from work. You get so seduced by these sort of lush pictures and the experts and them teaching you things throughout the, the program that you just stay. Um, and our length of tune, if you've learned about, you know, sort of how Nielsen measures people watching, one of the things that we look for is length of tune. And the length of tune of a Scripps network is really, really high. The other thing that we excel at is our networks are watched live. They're watched live as much as sports and news are. Um, nobody, you know, watches television live anymore, but they do watch the Scripps Networks live, partly because they're not tuning into a show. They're not looking at, you know, every Tuesday night at 9, I have to watch my favorite show on Food Network. Instead, they feel like Food Network, so they turn it on and leave it on. And that's because we really do put a lot of work into building that brand filter that Michael was talking about. And we will actually sit in programming meetings, and one of the first things that we'll say is, Will she like it? And by she, I mean our viewer, because most of our viewers are women. And we really do ask the question, will she like this show? Will she like this talent? Because if we don't think so, if it feels like a Bravo show or a Discovery show, we don't do it. Yeah, there's this great, the, the Jeff Bezos mission statement for Amazon is still up on their website. And, he, and the whole thing centers on putting the consumer at the center putting the consumer first. Um, as a set of brands, I've always been impressed by Scripps, and I've followed this story, this weird kind of gravity-defying story that you have, which is when people aren't watching live and they're not watching television, they're watching more and more of your television every single year, and they're doing it so live. Um, because it's company, it's, it's, it becomes a part of the, the routine itself. So I've been very impressed with how at the center of, of, of everything you put your consumer. Can we just uh, taste test this here for a second? So what are the Scripps Networks, really quickly? Food Network. Food Network, Cooking Channel, HGTV, DIY Network, Great American Country, and Travel Channel. So who here watches one of those channels on a regular basis? Thank That's you. That's amazing. With given the age of, of the average you're young, age. young, we yeah, love exactly. that. So who here who watches one of those networks on a regular basis emulates the behavior that Kathleen was just talking about, which is you turn it on because you're in the mood and you leave it on for a long period of time. So, you know, it's also defying most of the age demographics as well. HGTV and Food Network are both top 10 networks, yeah, or top 15 networks, without necessarily having a top 10 show individually. It's the network that resonates really well. So, the question I have for both of you, so, uh, Michael, you started in advertising, yeah? 
Yeah, I did. I started my career in, in uh, actually uh, as, as an intern um, when I was in school like you guys. Actually, I came to one of these events um, similar to this, that was, and there were people on the panel talking about advertising, and I thought it was just a really interesting career choice because I was a person, and some of you guys are probably that way, where you, you like um, analytical things, but you also like creative things. You know, you might be a person who likes math, but you also like music. And one of the things that was interesting about advertising and marketing was that it sort of blends and gives both of those things. It gives you a chance to think, as Evan was saying, strategically about brands and, and, and uh, target audiences and a lot of quantitative things. But then you also get to execute creatively by making ads. You see guys watch commercials. There's music in them. There's actors in them. There's video. There's all kinds of really creative stuff. So that's, that's what drew me to advertising. And Kathleen, you started as a reporter. I started as a journalist, but like Michael, um, I also was an intern, and I hope that all of you have on the top of your list to be interns, because there is nothing more valuable than being an intern. Um, I was an intern twice. I got offered jobs out of both of my internships, and I would not be sitting here today if I hadn't been an intern. Um, but I wanted to be a journalist, and I was for about 15 years. I worked at CBS News um, for a long time, and I also worked at KPIX in San Francisco for a bit. Um, but I left journalism, even though it's what I wanted to do more than anything, I left journalism partly because I am married to a journalist and we have three children and it just didn't work. I was at CBS Network, so I was like traveling all over the world at a moment's notice, which was totally fun, best job I've ever had. I wish I could turn the clock back and still do it, but um, it is not a good job for a family. So I decided to leave and come to Food Network um, about 15 years ago because it was sort of like journalism. It's kind of service journalism. It's stories about food, as simple as that sounds, um, but it's taking a subject matter, teaching people something the way a journalist does, but also making it entertaining and fun. So it kind of took journalism skills and twisted them a little bit. Um, and at the time also, cable was really growing, and there were a lot of women in cable, whereas there weren't a lot of women in the, in the executive ranks at news. So I sort of was looking ahead and thinking, you know what, I don't see a lot of female mentors here for me, um, I think I'll try cable. And so, Michael, you started in advertising, connected, obviously, to, to what you're doing now, but not directly. And Kathleen, you started in uh, journalism, which is, again, connected to, but not necessarily directly into what you're doing now. And yet, the two of you have built some of the strongest brands in television and, and risen to kind of some of the more important jobs uh, you know, in the industry by dint of the success that you've had. Did you learn this through educational training? Did you learn this through on-the-job training? How does, one, how does one evolve? You've been at, at Scripps for 17 years. You've been there for 15 years? Well, we started about the same time. So 17 and, years. And we went to college together. Yeah, which is, by the way, an example of the power of a network, although you did not know that you went to college together when you started working together, correct? Well, that's one of the things that, that amazes me about um, when you're in college, that, that, that um, you know, all the people that you're sitting next to are basically going to be the leaders of the future. And I don't know if I would have thought when I was at that frat party doing beer bongs that the people, <laughs> that the people next to me were going to be running companies. Drink responsibly, or, drink um, responsibly. You know, but I, I mean, also when I was at Stanford, there was a woman named Susan Rice who became you know, the uh, um, national security advisor. I mean, there are other people that... Have, yeah. yeah, I mean, Stanford has very <laughs> few famous um, but But you wouldn't have known it when we were, you know, you wouldn't have known it when we were were, uh, you know, painting our faces before the football games and acting stupid. So, but um, back back <laughs> to my question. Um, <laughs> but I, but how, I, how did you? How do you go from beer, po beer pong and beer bongs and and journalism? And I'm assuming there was a, a, a beer bong in, in your uh, background too as well. No. But uh, <laughs> but how do you go from? How do you how do you learn how to do what you do? Because it's not as if it's not as if like I could teach myself editing. That's a skill. I can teach myself copywriting. That is a skill and a talent mixed together. But the, what the two of you do is much more, much more intuitive, and, and what you do is a thousand different things on a daily basis. Programming, brand, marketing, ad sales, affiliate sales, uh, you know, uh, new platforms, which you're both working on right now. How do, you, how do you continually train yourself to evolve into who you are today over 15, 20 years? Well, I think for me it's uh, two things. One, it's kind of figuring out, and I was lucky enough when I was a student to figure out what it was that really turned me on, what I was excited to do. And, um, and that has always been having something to do with making things that entertain people. I, when I was in college, I was a DJ, and I used to DJ parties, and that used to be one of my favorite things. I, I got the biggest high from picking the right song that made people get up off of the, the couch and, and dance. And so 
I knew that I wanted some sort of career path or some sort of job that would allow me to make things that made other people happy and made other people enter entertained. Um, so that, that was step one. Step two then was once you figure out what that is, you're constantly learning and training and absorbing as much information about that as you can. You, you, I read biographies, I met, went on informational interviews with people, I read, tra I read trade magazines. I think some of the previous um, panelists were talking about the, the YouTube videos that you can watch um, these days. Just make yourself a student of that particular thing that you do. And then throughout my career, I've, in various roles, I've always been involved with making and, and marketing and promoting and making people enjoy uh, content. And then I just constantly, that, that's, that's, my, you know, that's, my, that's my gig. And, and I think similar to Michael, I mean, I, I approach my, my career as, as if it's the furthering of my education. Um, because I was doing a lot of beer pong in college, I didn't study that hard. But when I got to work, I actually studied a lot harder. Um, and I still study every single day. I, I walk around with a notebook, and I, in every, every day, I have a different page on my notebook, and I just write down things that I'm learning, because every day I feel like I'm learning something new. I mean, Michael's involved in a whole new world that didn't even exist a couple of years ago. So, I mean, I can't even imagine all the stuff that he's learning every day, but it, it's just sort of approaching your job with the same curiosity that you approached your education as a student. Um, learning, asking questions, admittedly faking it sometimes because, I mean, I, I don't know about you, but I find myself, we have a lot of really smart people that we work with, and I will sit in a meeting every now and then and go, I don't know what the hell they're talking about, but you kind of smile and nod and just write a lot of notes, and then you go figure it out later. Um, but just constantly absorbing everything that's around you. When you hear of something interesting, just dive a little deeper, stick your hand up when there's an opportunity to do something in that new world. And, and that's how opportunity comes. Yeah, I mean, I can't tell you how many times I've walked out of a meeting, having written something down, and then I rush back to my desk and I'm like, Google, KPI. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I keep saying, everybody, what, KPIs may, really may be very important. To, and I had no idea, the first time I heard KPI, I was probably the only person in the room that, does anybody here know what a KPI is? A uh, key performance indicator? So, like, the first time I heard that, and I was old when I heard this. I had to go back to my desk. How to put together a business plan. I, rem I specifically remember Googling that in my 30s. Yeah, I think um, one of the, the biggest lessons that I've learned is that, you know, I thought after going to college, it was all done. It was like, okay, wow, you know, I got through that last midterm, that last final, now it's, and it really isn't. It's just the beginning of your journey because, you know, we graduated from college in the 1980s and, and um, you think about that, you know, Everything that we learned at that time has been long out of date. There was no internet when we were in college. There was no Facebook, Snapchat, any of those kinds of things. So all the things that you guys are learning right now, you know, in 20 years it's going to be basically useless. So you're, it's, it's, it's what you learn over the next 20 or 30 years of your career that's going to determine your success. Well, and, and to that very point, something that, that, that I say to a lot of people who are going in for an interview with someone like you is chances are you have something that you can teach us immediately, something you know about your consumer behavior or, or things that are out there that we have to go back to our desk after you say it and Google to say, what the hell is Snapchat? Um, so, um, w you know, you have something to offer immediately. You just have to know how to articulate it and put it out there in a consumable fashion and know how to put your elevator pitch together so that that's very transferable and very readable by someone like this in a, in a moment's notice. So, so Michael, uh, Kathleen uh, hinted at this, but you, you like I, are uh, working in SVOD, OTT, uh, a little bit more um, than we have in the past. And that's relatively, that's new to both of us and to all of us on the stage is Netflix got into the streaming business early on, but for the rest of the world, many, many of the big companies are catching up. W what are you seeing or what are you learning as you investigate SVOD for such a great brand set as Scripps that you didn't know before? I uh, insights that, you, that have struck you in just in the last six, eight, ten months. Well, I think that one of the biggest insights is that um, you know technology uh, tends to start out slowly and, and be adopted relatively slowly, and then it hits this tipping point where just bam, it just changes overnight, and it really shocks you. It sneaks up on you um, faster th than you can imagine. And so, the the way people have been watching television has been gradually changing over the last maybe six or seven years. As Netflix launched, people started plugging their computers into their television screens, and they started watching online video little by little. But in the last couple of years, that's really, really exploded. There are these devices called streaming devices. I'm sure. How many of you guys have Roku? or Apple TVs or 
Chromecast, Chromecast or see, look at that. that's amazing. If I had asked that question three years ago, there'd been maybe three or four hands. So that's just totally changed the way people are getting television. They're not using cable boxes; they're using these devices, and. Our businesses have been traditionally about delivering television through those cable boxes. Now, as our, you, our future customers, are not watching television that way, we need to change how we deliver deliver the content and change, um, you know, the way we do the way we do business, um, or we're, we're going to lose lose you guys. So, that's that's been uh, um, re, um, really a, 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 inter the most interesting thing. And what's I mean for both of you when you when you think of it. So who here? So a lot of you watch Scripps networks, but who here does not have pay TV? Does not pay for their own cable subscription or satellite subscription? Raise your hand high. That's a big, who here uses mom and dad's, uh, okay. So you're still watching live television, obviously, and you're watching cable, but you're doing it illegally. So <laughs> on behalf of all three of us. <laughs> um, <laughs> so so when, you, when you reach out, to, uh, when you reach out to, to, to an audience like this, what's the knowledge gap that you see for yourself between, what they, between where you think the business is headed? So when you look at your when you look at everything that you're responsible for right now, including working on these new platforms and extensions of these brands onto new platforms, where do you see your knowledge gap where a group like this might be able to fit in? Well, I'll just say you guys intimidate the hell out of us, um, and I mean that you know with all due respect. You guys, you know, any digital native knows things so intuitively that Michael and I have to learn, um, and that's a real good selling point for you guys. You know, you you. You know so many things just sort of almost out of thin air that, that is so valuable in, in, a, in a company like ours um, that you should absolutely be maximizing that whenever you can. For me, I, I have a big knowledge gap when it comes to technology. Um, I don't understand it. I don't, I don't find it that interesting, which is probably why I don't really lean in and learn about it. I'm much more of a content person. But one of the things that I have learned throughout my career that I sort of wish I had learned earlier is you don't need to be an expert on everything. You just need to have smart people around you who are. Um, because if you try to be an expert in everything, you'll be good at most of them, but you won't be great at anything. If you find something that you're really good at, I mean, I, I'm, I am a really good content person. I know how to make television shows. That's, that's my one skill. Um, what I've done is, you know, put a lot of other, you know, great people around me that I can rely on to fill up those other gaps. So while I, on the one hand, I say be curious and learn as much as you can, don't try to do more than you really should because I think that's kind of a ticket to not doing things great. And, and you put a really terrific team around you who knows all these different things and, and, and again, probably best in breed with regards to what we do for a living. Um, what do you look for from a team member? Because it is a very, you, yours is a very team collaboration, uh, programming, marketing, all of it working incredibly in tandem. What, it, what, is, what are the qualities or what are the, the, key, the KPIs um, that you look for to, to put, cast somebody on your team? Sure. Well, it, first of all, it's, it's people who want to put team first. Um, at Scripps, we are va very famous for being an ego-free company. It really starts with our, our CEO, Ken Lowe, who's just a nice, down-to-earth guy. Um, we really we like people who want to be there, who want to be part of a team. And Michael and I have been at the company for a really long time, and I think that's a testament to the company. Um, certainly, we've had opportunities to go other places, but we like being there. We like the people that we work with. We've both gotten a lot of promotions in our years. Um, but I think it's because we've, we've both surrounded ourselves with people who are team players, who work really hard, who love what they do. I mean, to me, I'm always amazed when I meet somebody in the television business who's unhappy. It's like, hell, you're not working for a bank. I mean, you, you're entertaining people. This is like the most fun job in the world, isn't it? I mean, we entertain people for a living. Um, and that's the attitude, I think, that on, on my team anyway, that I expect. I want you to really like your job because if not, there's so many other people who would love to have it. Yeah, and, and leadership uh, without responsibility is a big portion of that, which is how do you, how do you lead by example? How do, you, how do you give to the team first and, and take for yourself last, especially when it comes to apportioning either blame or credit? Um, you know, th that is, a, that is a, a, one of the, I can say this because you're here and um, you don't have to say it on your own behalf, one of the greatest leaders that we have out there and a testament to the company is keeping you there because you've evolved up the food chain pretty much you know, every couple of years.
workers without without any kind of hesitation. So the, clearly, there's a great relationship between you and your your leadership there, but also to, to you and your team who retains great talent over years. So, Michael, you know, what do you when you when you look to hire a young person? Is there a skill set that you see that is really standing out right now that 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 gets the resume to the top of the pile? Um, is there is there a method to get to one of the two of you that beyond simply tackling you when you get off the stage <laughs> here today and offering you a beer pong tournament? Um, you know, wh wh what is it that breaks through the clutter? Because there are a lot of people here, and only two or three of them are gonna are gonna necessarily pop to the top of a resume pile. Uh, well, it's pretty easy to. I've always been really, really easily accessible. I mean, people email me directly, and I um, respond to them. Uh, well, what makes you stand out, I think, is um, just having the, doing things a little bit different than the way they've been done before. You know, I've always had this philosophy that whatever, whatever task you're asked to do, and this is starting from the beginning of your career, let's say you're just an assistant making coffee for, for, for a more senior person, what can I do in that task to do it in a way that person's going to recognize that, you know, they added a little bit, um, something a little bit special to, to the task. So, um, think about that, that, that no job that you have or no assignment that you're given is too small and, and is, not, is not so small that you can't figure out a way to do it, do it better. I remember having, working with an assistant years ago and her, her role was just to clean the, ref, ref, one of her jobs was to clean the refrigerator in, 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 in our um, production office. And I remember one morning we came in and she had put these little um, labels in the refrigerator uh, like on every little single thing like the, the uh, non-fat milk goes here and this goes there and this goes there and just, she just took that job and added a little something special to it and made herself um, um, st stand out. So I think that you know that that's that's a really important thing. Another thing I always another thing I always look for from people is is uh, something called emotional intelligence. I think a lot of you guys have probably heard about that, and um, it's really that ability to control um, yourself and, and manage yourself. And, and in fact, there was a, I don't have any, have anybody, anybody heard about the, uh, the the Stanford Marshmallow Study? Ever heard that? When you guys were studying about where they, where they had, they took <clears throat> little kids. Another Stanford plug. <laughs> Shameless. Stanford plug. But well, there's also the Stanford prison experiment. Well, wasn't, 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 <laughs> that wasn't so good. It's a little bit different. That, that's how we met. We'll be actually. doing that in the basement <laughs> later. But the marshmallow study, they took uh, uh, you know, kids between the ages of three and six, and they, uh, they asked them, they said, we can give you a marshmallow now. Or they so, or I can leave the room and, and come back in 15 minutes and give you two marshmallows. And they found that the kids that were willing to wait and delay gratification and wait for that second marshmallow, when they tracked them years later, they had higher SAT scores, higher um, um, school performance, and even and even lower body mass index. <laughs> Um, so, which, I, which I guess is, goes with the uh, with, with, with that, but but it basically shows that if you have that, if you're able to control your emotions, control how you deal with situations, and manage yourself, you're going to be a whole lot more successful. And those are both kind of uh, two sides of the coin of attention to detail, is what you were saying about the the fridge there. No no LinkedIn message, no email, no text is 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 not worth paying attention to from a spelling standpoint, from a gra grammar standpoint, yes. from a politeness standpoint, from an empathy standpoint, which goes to the EQ standpoint. So when you're sending an email or a LinkedIn message to someone like this, try to read it from their point of view. Mm -hmm. Is it well written? Is it short? Is it short? <laughs> is it short? It's like location, location, location for. Uh, the Flipping Brothers, but the, 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 the key here is how will it be read? Um, and make sure that you look at it from that point of view. So we have about five minutes left. I think we can open it up to questions in the audience if anybody has any. Raise your hand. And I think we have a mic out there that we can don a hue over to you, which is a reference that very few of you will get. Um, right there? We think right there? Right there. Say your name, please, too. Hello, hi. Name is July Yang. I'm a uh, Lubin School graduate student, um, MBA, Strategic Management and Finance Management. Uh, my question is, I've been in, first of all, higher education for the last more than 10 years straight. So I have a uh, classical music background. I was trained as a concert pianist. So about three years ago, I decided to make a career change. Uh, my, so my question is, it seems to me over the years that I've been in higher education and working, uh, a very important capability is the ability to learn. And how is the ability to learn valued when companies like yours, uh, when you're hiring? And how do we, um, does that stand out? And how do you value that? And how does that um, 
enhance your career development throughout your life. Yeah, there are a lot of people here who are, are, have said to me, at least over the years, that they're looking to change careers. So we have a lot of grad students here today. You know, how does, how does a capability like learning and emotional intelligence get judged on a resume or in an interview? I, you know, I think it, it's extremely important. And one way that you demonstrate that is um, when you go for an interview, you show how much you've learned about the organization. You know, I, I'm amazed um, by how f infrequently uh, um, people come into an interview um, having really read up, just whether it's Google information, there's, there's just so much, there's YouTube information, there's tons of stuff. Um, so that's a perfect example. When you, get the, when you get that interview with that company, you've got five days or seven days, that's, that's a, a case study for you to actually show what you can learn. You, and it's like cr cramming for a final. And if you can come into that interview showing in five days, I've learned so much about your company that I, I mean, I even know what you're going to do tomorrow. <laughs> um, that can blow you away. But I'm so disappointed by people that come into interviews and they're sort of like, well, so um, tell me about your, they ask me, <laughs> so tell me about scripts. <laughs> That's a, that's a yeah, really you know, if I, if I could just um, reiterate what Michael said, it, it, it is the kiss of death to come in either to do an informational interview where, you know, someone like Michael or I have taken the time out of our day or to come in for a real job interview and not be an A-plus student on what it is we do, what's on the air, what was on the air a year ago, our careers, you know, you can read about us. People who don't come in prepared, I, I, mean, I don't know about you, but I just zone out because I've already decided I can't have them on the staff. Yeah, you should be prepared to ask the first three questions in any interview, at Even least. Even if you know the answers, right. just come up with some really smart questions. I saw questions. you did this. Exactly. What, did, what was the thinking there? And then send a thank you note. Yeah. Do not forget that. Yeah, and email and thank you notes are fine, so. as long as they're well, Actually, <laughs> spelled I think, well. I think an email um, thank you note is better, because then you attach your resume onto it. Because what we oftentimes will do is we'll meet somebody interesting. Maybe they're not quite right for the job, but you write a lovely thank you note that has more details in it with other thoughts. You know, don't just thanks for your time. Write a note, because there's a good chance that we'll be forwarding it on to colleagues. So write a good note about you, about you know, what you thought about the meeting, any other ideas. Attach your resume, because we do forward those on. And, it, and also, that's a perfect example of a, of a way to, or, or an opportunity where you can break out and do something different. And I, I have been impressed that there was actually somebody who we ex ended up hiring who, instead of just sending an email thank you note, she actually walked over a note in person, a handwritten note, came to our reception desk, <laughs> and uh, and brought me the note personally, um, which I, would say, I thought that that was that was special. Most people don't do that. She took the time to come all the way, find you know, back to her offices, take t hours out of her day to do that. So always think about what is it I can do that's just a little bit different than what anybody else would do. Okay, we, we only have time for one more question. I'm really, really sorry. Um, but you guys are going to be around for a little bit? Okay, good. Lunch. Hi, right, I'm here for um, lunch, so, so uh, make sure you uh, reach out at lunch. Go ahead. Hi, I'm Monique. I'm a broadcast and digital journalism major at um, Syracuse University. So I'm Go wondering... Orange. <laughs> so I'm wondering, as Scripps um, expands into the digital Snapchat realm, do you think that its presence on like cable and on actual TV is going to change and shrink at all? Um, no. I think what we're trying to do, um, and I think what we've been really good about doing, is we really value the, the cable presence that we have. You know, we, you know as, as you heard, we have got top ten networks. Sometimes on a night we're like a top one or two network, you know, we've got a really robust, huge audience that watches us on, on traditional cable. So instead, what we're doing is we're expanding. So we, we had the first food brand on Snapchat. Um, we're making about 100 Facebook Live um, assets every month. I mean, we're just doing a ton of other video and other content. We have two magazines, Food Network and HGTV. We're taking our brands and expanding them. So I think the last thing that we would ever do is shrink what we do on traditional television. Instead, we're, we're embracing all new technologies to expand our platforms. And that also gets to another point, which is if someone's talking to you and they've already made content for a Facebook Live event or for Snapchat, that's a, that's a competitive advantage, right? And that's something you can do today on your own. Um, without necessarily having a huge set of resources in front of you. If you have work on your, on your Facebook page that you're proud of, or, or Vines or Snaps that you think are great, that's a really good calling card. 
Yeah, to the question about um, how do you change careers and demonstrate things, you have that ability. I, I was able to do that within my own career within the industry. I was used to work in the more of a sales and, um, and business to business function, and I wanted to get more into a creative job. And so just outside of work, I did a bunch of creative things. I wrote music and, and made, wrote small sort of off, off Broadway shows and just did stuff that I could then demonstrate to people within my company that I had these, this other skill set. So don't be defined by the job that you have or the role that you have. Think of yourself more in a broader sense, and there's many other ways that you could express your creativity. So these two will be around for lunch. Uh, thank you both very much. Can I say, can I say one thing? Um, we are hiring, and, and, and we are doing Key it both words. in New York and Knoxville, interns. We have a good internship program. We don't get a lot of New Yorkers who apply, but we've got openings in New York. We have openings in Knoxville. We have openings in other cities. So please, if you're interested, please go to our website um, and check out our internship opportunities. Cool. Thank you very much.